Welcome to a special podcast series with Dr. Mark Henry, author of the book, In Fact, An Optimist's Guide to Ireland at 100. Mark and I will have a chat about the quality of life in Ireland today through the lens of issues that impact us all, such as the economy, uh, education and well-being uh, and health. And of course, the many challenges that face us in terms of climate change, biodiversity, housing and the cost of living. Hello, this is Michal Martin, Tornishta, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Defence and Leader of Fianna Fáil. And I'm here with Mark Henry, uh, an uh, author of, in fact, An Optimist's Guide to Ireland at 100. Uh, a book which he says on the cover, if you want to cheer yourself up, read it. Um, that, that was said by Professor Luke O'Neill. So, Mark, could I ask you at the outset, um, if you would set out your stall, so mm. to speak, in terms of Ireland 100 years after 1922, Exactly. You know, this, we have achieved an awful lot. We've achieved an awful lot. And of course, the new cycle, any one particular day focuses, of course, on the short term and what's negative. But we only have to look back on that hundred years to say, wow, not only have we taken our place amongst the nations of, our, of the world, we've taken our place amongst the leading nations of the world by any reckoning. And I'm going to provide the evidence in our chat here, whether it's the, the top 10 best this or the top 20 that. Ireland is up there amongst the leading nations of the world. So, for example, we'll just take the United Nations who produce an annual kind of human development index, right? And they say of all the places in the world, Ireland is currently eighth in terms of quality of life, eighth best in the world in terms of places to live. And they're looking at that from a variety of perspectives. They're saying, well, do people live long and healthy lives here? So, I mean, we are, let's touch on that. We're one yeah. of the longest and, and, and healthiest, longest living and healthiest places to live. They say, secondly, what about education levels? Again, when we we'll talk about this, right, Ireland has amongst the most highly educated peoples on the planet. And then they look then at standard of living. And again, by any metric, Ireland is, is a fantastic place to live. Now, of course, we have problems. Of course, there's no country in the world that's, uh, that's cracked it completely. Uh, but by any uh, uh, objectives, we've done really, really well. And I wrote the book, you know, An Optimist Guide to Ireland at 100, because, of course, we celebrated our 100th birthday there in December, at least the 100th anniversary of the foundation of the Irish Free State, and ultimately then, of course, the, the republic that we're living in today. Uh, I did feel, of course, we should be celebrating that occasion a lot more. There was no public holiday. We didn't have parades down O'Connell Street. And I should ask you, Tanish, to why, why we didn't celebrate that wonderful occasion a bit more. I think that's a fair point. I think uh, we did a lot of academic conferences on the Anglo-Irish Treaty, on the Civil War, on the formation of the first free state government. And I participated in all of them. I suppose there, there has always been a sense in terms of the birth of the, sta of the state was a difficult one in the context of civil war, the separation from Britain in terms of the treaty and so on like that. And I, I think maybe we walked too gingerly <laughs> over all of that um, yes. because there is an, an awful lot to celebrate. Um, and also conscious pol politicians today are conscious of the current context. And, uh, and I might ask you later as to why that sense of achievement isn't perhaps as felt um, across the population. And I think you have some interesting conclusions in the book in respect of that. But maybe if we could focus in on the health area. What I think is fascinating in the first uh, in the chapter on health in particular, if you you do, the, the, I think, the top 20 killers in 1922 and you look mm -hmm. at Tuberculosis is, I think, number one there. You, you have uh, bronchitis, you have cancer, you have heart disease um, and pneumonia uh, and, and all of those. Uh, and the chapter, there's a chapter heading saying we're living 25 years longer now than those who were alive in 1922. Can exactly. you take us through some of that and what the game changers are in respect of that? Exactly. So I mean, thinking about that, tw so we're living 25 years longer than people were in the 1920s. I mean, it's a whole generation. You know, we've added a whole generation to our lifespans. Now, you know, people say, wait a minute, that's true of many other places. Well, yes, but the Irish are now the longest living in Europe. We have the longest lifespan of any EU country. Uh, we managed through COVID well. Uh, we're now living only two years less uh, than the world's longest livers, uh, which is the, the Japanese. So, you know, we really have added uh, a lot to it. I mean, you mentioned disease. So, yeah, you look at the top 20 list of killers and you mentioned some of them from the 1920s. Actually, the majority of those top 20 we have eliminated practically entirely. I mean, talk about tuberculosis. Of course, there's things like diphtheria, measles, whooping cough, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Appendicitis was a top 20 killer uh, back in the 20s. Now, of course, again, lots of improvements that are international 
in their scale. Uh, you know, Ireland hasn't solved uh, uh, appendicitis alone, but we have practically been really extraordinarily good at, at both adopting healthier behaviours as citizens and investing in our healthcare system. Now, you know, people say, oh, well, now the healthcare system. Yeah, but hang on. Again, in our own lifetimes, in the 1970s, the, you know, the Irish government uh, was spending at that time an average about 350 euros per man, woman and child on health care in today's money. Now it's over 3000 euros per man, woman and child in the same currency. And of course, the population is two million more in terms of people. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the number of health treatments in hospitals has doubled in 20 years. It, and I think one of the great lessons from that, uh, in some respects, as a former minister for health, is that the national debate always focuses on the emergency, on the immediate, often to the detriment of the more longer term thinking. I mean, prevention ultimately should always be the key health policy uh, and a strategic approach to health. I can recall coming into health when um, heart disease and cancer back in the late 90s mm-hmm. was still identified as the great killer in Ireland and the great differentiators between Ireland and the rest of Europe because we, w- we would have been much lower down the tables mm-hmm. then in terms of survival uh, and lifespan uh, and really it was the more strategic look at cardiovascular which took in behaviour um, healthy eating uh, exercise very basic things um, but very often any Minister for Health will be drawn away from that strategic sort of perspective and you're back into emergency departments, which are very important for the person right now who's waiting hours to get a bed and so forth. But sometimes it can skew policy uh, focus. And I think that's one of the lessons I draw from the book, that if you stand back and look at the longer term, uh, you see the big changes are, are around lifestyle uh, and prevention accident prevention, for example, in terms of road deaths and so on. Well, exactly. I mean, you talk about cancer mortality rates. So, you know, exactly like even for those in the 1990s, if you had a cancer diagnosis, 60 percent of people, that was a that was a death sentence within, you know, within five years. Unfortunately, they passed away today. That's reversed. More than six in 10 will survive longer than five years. You know, so we've made we've made very good progress, as you say. Uh, and again, th- again, one of the key points there, you yeah. know, the, the, the centers of excellence that was developed exactly. uh, in more recent times. A lot of opposition to that. I can remember all the protests around hospitals, uh, action committees, don't move uh, the cardiac from here, don't move the cancer centre from here. We don't want it centralised in one area. And there was a political campaign almost yes. in every county hospital uh, I, I, as we evolved. Exactly. But it, as you say, it was that centralisation that made specialists of, of doctors. In other words, you had people who weren't in a general hospital, you know, doing one or two breast cancer tumour removals a week. Instead, you had people whose job it was to do that every day of the week. And building up that expertise has absolutely increased uh, the survival rate uh, for a cancer diagnosis. So absolutely, that building up of specialisms has, has been one of the success factors. And of course, you talked about uh, our, how, how people's healthy behaviours have changed. And of course, for cancer, one of the huge ones was smoking, you know, was yep, cutting out yep. smoking. I mean, you go back to, to the early 70s, smokers on average, average, were smoking 20 cigarettes a day. Average, never mind, you know, some who were the occasional smokers, you know. So, of I, course, I, I remember being in Geneva at a World Health Assembly and there was a human s- skeleton up on, you know, on, on the wall and about 100 diseases kind of pointing, coming out of it, all related to smoking. And uh, in many mm-hmm. respects, it's one of the great no-brainers from a health perspective. Uh, and what was very interesting during the smoking ban and all of that was when you s- subsequently, when you surveyed people, which we didn't do in advance of the decision, but afterwards, those most people wanted to give up. Yes. Most people want yes. to give up. Yeah. You uh, you're pointing there to one of our innovations. And of course, you contributed to that exactly, which was, you know, being the first country to ban uh, smoking in the workplace, including, you know, in, in pubs and restaurants. And, and it's an example that's now been followed all over the world. I mean, again, something that Ireland should be proud of that has de- de- contributed to those reductions in, in cancer, contributed to those survival rates. Uh, it's smoking. Actually, we're also way past peak alcohol consumption as well in Ireland. You know, it was, uh, let me see, about 20 years ago that uh, on average, yeah, yeah, 20, 2001 on average, Irish people were drinking about 14 litres of pure alcohol a year. You know, there's a, a lot of pints <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> nowadays, we're down to 
10 litres. Now, it's still above where, where yeah. the UN or, you know, recommends us to be, where the Department of Health guidelines. It's still, if you were to turn that into pints, that's an average of 420 pints a person. Well, I would argue that they, and, and we're and going I, the right way. And I enjoy a pint myself, but the alcohol industry is probably one of the most resilient industries against any move to try and acknowledge even the harmful impacts mm. of alcohol on health. Uh, and there's a lot of resistance to the idea that alcohol causes cancer, but it does. And the lesson of the last 100 years from your book is actually these public health measures have a huge impact. I remember drink driving, Rouse and Doyle Irden in my own party. Uh, Michael Smith, Noel Dempsey were very unpopular within the parliamentary party. Noel at times when he brought in the drink driving laws mm. uh, and various other laws. Mm. Uh, and he yes. was probably at that time one of the more unpopular ministers. Yeah, sure. Yet the impact himself and Gay Bourne and the Road Safety Authority has been dramatic. Yes, yes, you know, exactly. The likelihood of dying on the roads being reduced by three quarters over the last 40 years. And undoubtedly, drink driving law has been part of that. Of course, a whole load of other road safety initiatives, advertising mm-hmm. and, you know, connecting that to alcohol, of course. The proposal yes. again yeah. that now we yeah. will put labels, uh, health warnings on alcohol. Again, a world first pr- you know, proposal by Ireland. Why not? You know, the yeah, evidence. Not a pushback against it, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. you know, a chance for us again to be leaders, again, to take pride in that, whether it succeeds or not. And hopefully it does. You know, again, like the smoking will be one of the first to encourage a change that I see everywhere else following. Mm. The area I see need, need for improvement is, and it's happening, is in, in integration of community-based health. Um, so the community-enhanced program that mm. HSE are rolling out now and the government is rolling out. But... The idea that we would, in terms of, again, it's, it's to do with healthier lifestyles and it's to do with sort of working with senior citizens, working with young people in terms of mental well-being in the community, I think can yield better results. And if we can integrate that with the acute systems, those are the big challenges which we haven't managed to crack over yes. the last 20 odd years. Well, and what one I call out in the book, you know, because I do talk about some of our challenges we had into yeah. our second century is, of course, the excess weight of the population as well. Do you know, I mean, in other words, the degree of overweight and obesity in the population. So, again, you know, there's only, unfortunately, a third of us, a little over a third who are described as normal weight. Uh, nearly four in ten of us are overweight a quarter of us are obese by the medical definition so you know and and the point is a bit like smoking right you know that'll take 20 30 years uh, to see when we get to older age if we're carrying that weight that's obviously going to have implications for us and again by some reckonings Ireland is amongst the worst in Europe in this uh, you know but but, but, Professor Donald O'Shea and others have been highlighting this for for decades to be fair I, I recall setting up obesity task forces uh, you need persistent focus on this. Uh, I think the emphasis of, on sport is important, but of course not every child in the classroom um, is, is, is entirely sports focused. So this idea of really making physical education part and parcel of every child's life is key. I remember reading the book on Okinawa one time. There was a major health study done in the 1970s and they had the longest, they, they had the most centenarians of any place in the world. But part of it was, I think, about 80% plant, I think they had, but they also drank a lot of green tea (laughs) but they did martial arts in primary school from the earliest years Mm. every child did Uh, and I wonder was was that a factor both in their mental well-being and in their physical lifespan Mm. um, and and, and so forth so I think we have a bit of work to do there I think there's that and I think you know there's obviously a lot of growing evidence now that ultra processed foods are contributing you know and that uh, we aren't really appreciating uh, that a lot of the, the, the processed food stuff and the ingredients in them which encourage us to consume more of them, whether they're crisps or ready meals or whatever, are actually harmful in the amounts that we're eating them. So I, I think exactly where there's another wave coming of, of, of public I think health. fresh food and, 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 and if we can locally source it, uh, I think is the key in season. The, the, the final point I would make to you on health is this, that 25 years we're living longer. We're top of at the top of the EU league table in, in terms of lifespan is an incredible uh, fact uh, that I don't think has been properly realised out there in general society uh, because I would have had some idea back in the late 90s that we weren't performing at a level that we should have been. I was uh, speaking to the, the Commissioner for Human Development, uh, Leonardovich, yesterday uh, in, in, in Brussels um, and um, we were talking about and he was making the point about Africa and the developing world and so on. And, and he was somewhat critical that there's an overemphasis on investment in projects and communications and windmills and so on, <laughs> whereas he felt we needed to invest in people. 
And in many ways, that was the big change in Ireland, I think, in the turn from the late 50s into the 60s, mm. that we started investing in education. And actually, I came across recently, we were celebrating the uh, centenary of the birth of Paddy Hillary, who was an understated politician, but actually who started that sort of change in thinking. Uh, and he made a very significant speech in Doyle Earden when he said, we need more education, not less looks like a fairly obvious thing, but at the time he was being counselled by experts and civil servants that we won't have jobs for people if you educate them more. Yes. <laughs> it seems extraordinary now. Yes. But he turned it around. Um, and then Don O'Malley followed and so on with free education. And then, you know, the barometer I always use, and I'm a former teacher, uh, school completion, school completion. And when I see any child coming into a classroom from any background, you really want that child to see out their potential. And your book draws out some important evidence around mm -hmm. school completion at second level but more importantly, progression uh, to third level. Exactly, exactly. You know, I think education, our level of education is one of the factors that has really led to Ireland's success globally. I mean, you know, as you say, uh, if it was because of our educated population that we've been able to attract in the investment that we need in order to develop the country. And uh, so we'll come back to that, but it's one of our success factors. Now, you mentioned Donna O'Malley. So I, I was talking at the Dublin Book Festival at the, uh, at the launch of the book and, uh, and people in, in the audience were saying, well, you know, it's very interesting, Ireland's success over the last hundred years. What one person would you highlight who's contributed so much to Ireland's success? Now, of course, it's no one individual. We've all played our part, actually. But I did say... Donica O'Malley, who was the Minister of Education, who made second level education free, but not for that reason, because in fact, Ireland was well behind the curve on second level education in the sense that in France, it was free for everybody after the First World yep. War. In Britain, after the Second World War, you know, Ireland was a laggard. But what he also did within the space of just two to three years is that he created an entirely new class of third level education that is basically STEM and business oriented science, technology and engineering and maths. In other words, he created these regional technical colleges yes. that came, you know, and ultimately now a lot of them, of course, are now universities and now technological universities all these years later. So he created like literally within the space of three years at a report done in year one saying we're missing a whole level of education here. The universities didn't even teach business. There's no practical education we're uh -huh. missing it and he created that and had the first of them up and running within and it's years. arguable that gave the the backing or, 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 or the, the resourcing human capacity to many of the emerging pharmaceuticals that came into ireland in the 70s um who were able and they, with the, many of them will say to you that the regional colleges what are now technological universities provided them with the engineers the instrument those expert in instrumentation and a whole lot, range of other skills that were essential building blocks to yeah. building pharma, life sciences uh, in the country. And it gave a regional focus, but above all, of course, it increased participation in third level education quite dramatically. That's it, you know, and, and to be honest, that's, that's the critical <coughs> thing. So, so let's come back to second level, but in, yeah. terms, of, in terms of third level, uh, we are amongst the most highly educated people in the world, right? So in other words, of those of a working age, uh, the majority of adults, you know, the most recent statistics, 53 percent of us have some form of third level qualification, might be a certificate, might be a degree, might be an apprenticeship, might be a PhD. So that is actually equivalent in European terms. Only Luxembourg is there or thereabouts with us uh, in a global context. You're up there with Canada, you're there with Singapore. I mean, we are amongst the most highly educated people. So of those who finish the Leaving Cert now, just uh, this year, going to, looking forward to the autumn, seven in 10 of them will go on to some form of third level education. Now, when I studied psychology in UCD back in the early 90s, it wasn't 50%, it was 15% of people, right? As, as recently yeah. as the early 90s, who had third level qualifications amongst adults. So, you know, the change has been, has been transformative. And as you say, it has been an attractor bringing in that investment no because question. we had the skill base. Now, I would challenge you on one <coughs> thing, if I might, yep. which is, of course, that we've had this great growth and participation in, in third level, but the funding hasn't matched it. You know, funding going back was, was the peak in the Celtic Tiger years. Of course, there were cutbacks, of course, during, during the recession. But it means that as the numbers have grown, in fact, uh, you know, the, the parliamentary budget office says that the investment per student these days from government is half what it was back in 2008. And it does seem to me for such a critical area of our economy, uh, that's not good enough. I'd agree with that. And, um, you know, I was education minister in 97 to 2000. We did dramatically increase it in the early 2000s, particularly the fourth level, the research piece, which I'm still 
worried about. I think we need to do far more in, on the research side at fourth level um, on the basis of moving up the value chain and making sure we can continue to attract investment into the country because that R&D investment of the late 90s and early 2000s, I think, was critical for both retaining life sciences uh, technology companies, but also bringing in new levels of uh, investment from those companies and copper fastening their foothold there. But there is an issue there, and universities have been forced to do a lot of uh, revenue generation outside of mm. um, what they get from the state. Um, and, and that, in many ways, then can be disadvantaged to some Irish people as well. And we've had a recent debate at, at, at Cabinet in terms of medical places, for example, uh, in terms of increasing medical places and give more opportunities to Irish people uh, to, 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 um, to do medicine here and to, to the various um, p- professional qualifications. Whereas nearly 50% are, and it's a revenue issue too, to are, are coming in from overseas mm. to, to study here. Uh, that is an issue. And, um, uh, and again, I think the, 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 to me, if you look at the history of the country and the progress that you've d- documented, it all came about <coughs> from investment in education. So yes. I, t- I take that point, yes. and I think it's a very fair point. Yeah, I mean, as you <coughs> say, we've had huge increase in participation. For example, in in second level, you know, uh, but but you don't have to go too far back in history. Again, when I was in uh, in second level education, dare I say it, in the nineteen eighties, uh, at that time, of those who came in, let's say in first year uh, into second level education. Only three quarters were coming out the other end in terms of finishing a leaving yes, cert. Yeah, so a yeah. quarter didn't, you know. So, I mean, you know, and their job prospects obviously, you know, were curtailed as a result. We've seen huge increase in that. In other words, the completion rate that's going into second level. Now it's more than nine in ten, you know, will we'll finish. But importantly, actually, you know, a lot, there are a, a chunk of people now receiving second level education, a group who were not even catered for back in the day. Correct. Yeah. In other words, those in, with special needs, you know, they weren't even in the second level education system back in the in the 80s. Now, of course, that means you'll never reach 100 percent completion rate for Leaving Cert because that's not going to be appropriate for everybody. But I mean, that is, again, not only a are we having more success in keeping people in the system and giving them a good quality, you know, second level education. But secondly, we're catering for a whole range of, of, of special needs and in fact I you know I give you credit there as Minister for Education obviously you started investing in special needs assistance in the classroom yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and that's been transformative. We need to do more there though I would be critical myself of the absence of, of therapies in the classroom it's an ongoing debate between health and education in, in the sense that it, 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 they're in the health service whereas my view we uh, optimally I think as maybe from an education perspective we need multidisciplinary teams uh, in the schools to so that the speech therapists the um occupational therapists physio are available to, to children uh, as they learn and, and you have that multidisciplinary dimension which has been trialed in a number of schools and has worked out very well and that's that's work in, 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 in progress uh, but it is an issue that many parents will be angry about and rightly so um, and I think that, that that chapter isn't complete yet in terms of special needs and it remains a passion of mine and we have to get the synergy between health and education um, right. We also I think have to make sure that as we expand participation, that we broaden the curriculum, which we have been doing, and that the leaving certificate and that, that whole area of assessment must come more into play mm. uh, because we have to get more challenging in terms of the skill sets we can impart to younger people. It's not, sh- we, we've, we've, we, we've cracked the participation piece and the completion piece, but we now mm. make, need to make sure that every child kind of gets the chance to fulfill their potential. And very often, the right program, the right, the, type of uh, completion certificate be it a leaving cert applied leaving cert vocational and also the celebration of apprenticeship now is very very important and that has come back into the mainstream which is mm-hmm. great interesting year sir I studied done under the shared island initiative that we started two and a half years ago school completion between Northern Ireland and, and the Republic and it's much higher in the Republic because of the DESH program uh, which we brought in over I think 10 15 years ago which gives additional resources to schools in disadvantage, what we call disadvantaged mm. areas and so on, uh, uh, issues. And it's a very interesting because in the north it's an issue that in certain communities uh, the school completion rates are still quite low and the progression to third level is quite low with consequences mm. in terms of participation in society uh, and feeling belong, belong belonging to society or alternatively alienated from society. So yes. we, we have examples of where the centrality of this in societal terms can never be understated. Yeah, no, uh, you know, all that investment in putting special needs assistance, for example, into classrooms has dramatically improved, you know, the pupil teacher ratio and people 
I think people underestimate this. You know, I mean, even I had I had a child who had just finished her, her primary school education, the last of three. Thankfully, they're all in secondary now. Uh, she had a graduation there just recently, <laughs> such as it is. But, you know, yeah. and people are still saying, well, wait a minute, there's still 30 students in that class. Yeah, but actually, there's two teachers in it, you know, yeah. actually. So the, you know, the average uh, number of, of teachers uh, per, or number of pupils, I should say, per teacher in primary school has dropped from, you know, again, 1970s, oh, yeah, exactly. it mm-hmm. was 30 to 1. Now it's 15 to 1 because actually, you know, there are two people, generally speaking, a lot of classrooms helping helping those kids. So, so and I know teachers unions say there's not enough uh, teachers, but, but I say two things. I say, one, look at the very recent research that shows that uh, fourth class reading ability in Ireland yeah. a second only to Singapore. So the international figures, our kids are really well educated. It's primary level. So, again, excellent I, outcomes. Uh, my view know. is we have, an, we have a very strong uh, primary system. And I think a lot of that goes to the teacher training colleges, b- yes. b- both in physical in situ and, and, and online. But I think we must never lose that. Um, and I think the, we, we as parents, we found that uh, that the primary system is, is very even standards across. Uh, the entire system. It's a very strong yes. system and very high quality teachers uh, yes. on the ground. And I don't think we can ever lose that investment in teaching. Yes. Um, I mean, as you say, actually, uh, to that point, I make a, a reference to it in the book, do you know, our, our, our differences between different schools in different parts of the country, of course, there are some differences in, in outcomes for kids, but actually we have much lower variations than a lot of other countries. Most other countries have much greater variations between schools, let's say, in different socioeconomic areas than we do, which is, is a testament to our success. Uh, but also, actually, uh, of course, our, our, our kids' kind of population boom is moved up to second level now. So, I mean, they're going to yep. see improvements in parent-teacher, or sorry, uh, p- teacher-pupil yeah. ratios in, uh, for in primary levels and simply because the numbers be on, are dropping. Not, what might not be understood outside of education circles, it speaks to the value of a national curriculum for consistency of performance. And I, I think, you know, as I said, we, we still have a lot to do. And I take your point you know, on the third level and fourth level. I think we do, we need to have a really serious look at that in terms of uh, turning the dial around in terms of increased investment in that sector. Mm. Um, but uh, I think suffice to say that education has been uh, one of the great progress marks. And, and when I speak to aspiring states who want to come into the European Union, I often say to them, it's not the infrastructural funds that were key was the social fund that was key to Ireland, the European Social Fund, which we actually used to invest into regional technical colleges and expand them actually in the mm-hmm. 70s and 80s. Um, and I keep saying to any country that wants to become a member of the European Union, and I met with um, Albania recently, and uh, Eddie Rather, the, the leader there, and I said, look, it's the social fund, it's education and people that matters more than infrastructure. Infrastructure will come if you invest um, in people. And I think that's probably a segue to the economic progress of the country, because I, do, I think education investment is inextricably bound up with economic development. Yeah, and I, I, it is. And we'll, we'll let's turn to that. But it also is tied up to what we've been talking about previously, i.e. about uh, a health as well, because it, again, international statistics, those who have third level qualifications globally, on average, will live five years longer yeah. than those who don't, you know, because it speaks to uh, more health education, more awareness of, of, what, uh, of what the right health behaviours are. And that literally helps people live longer and healthier lives. So, so yeah, That education. is very true. And I've, I've been to visiting schools recently now where the kids are preparing the food. Uh, the kids are sourcing the food. They're growing their own food in uh, school gardens, okay. uh, which I think is just wonderful to yeah. see and it speaks to if you like the, the the connection between education and health and well-being great so do you want to segue now to the the economics uh, yeah and that inextricable link between education investment um and, and the economy and again it seems to me that period turning point the early 60s it, it's a it's a very important decade in, in 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 turning ireland around i get that sense because Instead of looking inwards, we start looking outwards. And sometimes I think in the, this era, we underappreciate the absolute importance of Ireland being global, of Ireland being a, you know, a core member of the European Union and a proactive member of the European Union, because it's all about that outward looking impulse, which turned our economy around. I, I strongly agree with that. Again, for me, Ireland's open disposition is one of the key success factors for Ireland as a nation 
over the last 40, 50 years. Openness in the sense of being open to bringing in foreign investment, yes. sure, but also the talent, which Absolutely. isn't necessarily here. We have to bring it in in order to help those companies grow. There's an openness there uh, in so many ways. I mean, we'll touch on it. But, you know, my my favorite graph in, in, in the book, in fact, an Optimist Guide to Ireland at 100, uh, is GDP per capita in real terms over the last 100 years. Now, what does that mean? It means our, our, our how much on average economic wealth there was per man, woman and child in the country since the 1920s. And you go back to the 1920s and, you know, the average wealth here of an individual was about 60 percent that of someone in Britain, it was about 40 percent that of someone in the States. And it remained that way in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. It began to go a little bit in the 60s, but we didn't catch up. So did those other nations grow. It was only really when the Celtic Tiger, you know, which t that took off and transformed Ireland uh, in the 90s uh, and into the noughties. That's when we saw our Irish uh, GDP per head begin to exceed Britain in the mid 90s and touch up there with the US in the noughties. Now, People say, now, wait a minute, GDP, this includes a multinational impact. Well, OK, but it didn't in the 20s, 30s, 40s, et cetera. But yes, but but I also demonstrate how that did have huge, genuine, real benefits for people. So let me talk about jobs, right? So in the 1920s, there were no more than 1.2 million people in employment in Ireland in the 1920s, right? And in the 30s, same number in the 40s and in the 50s. There was the same number in the 60s, same number of people in jobs in the 70s and in the 80s. So for those first 60 years of Irish history, there was no increase whatsoever on the number of, of people in jobs. Of course, immigration was the only solution. But then we began to see that export-led growth in the 90s. And within less than 20 years, the number of people in employment doubled. Now, latest statistics, we've reached uh, 2.6 million mm. people in employment. It's the highest ever re on record unemployment in Ireland now at a record low that even beats those Celtic Tiger years. And the population is a million more than it was back then. So, so this openness and this export-led economy model that we adopted, as you say, from the 60s, it took a while to, to, to see the benefits. It's come true, yeah. yeah. But genuinely has transformed Ireland for the better. When people say, you know, those multinationals, what are they doing for us? The answer is they're doing a hell of a lot for us, both in terms of employment and you know, corporate tax. And I think that economic model has worked spectacularly well. Um, and we've got to make sure that the indigenous base, which is growing, but it's not an either or. It's not like we've many good Irish companies have emerged, have developed and grown on, on the back of working with multinationals, supply chain. Uh, I, I, there's a great story in Charleville. You have a number of companies that were agriculture focused in terms of uh, developing equipment and vat, uh, big vats and so on like that, they transformed to do that for the pharmaceutical industry uh, and became mm -hmm. expert at it and then won international uh, contracts on the foot of uh, supplying into world-class companies and people said, well, if they can do it here, they can do it anywhere in the world. And we've had uh, com uh, companies in terms of project management, uh, all of that area go international because of cutting their teeth with multinationals. So the whole ecosystem has grown up uh, in terms of quality, skills and experience, which I think we shouldn't lose sight of. Um, yes. The yes. other point you made, openness. Uh, the openness is important not just to investment, but to people. Mm -hmm. And it's probably an underappreciated uh, factor here because if you meet any company today, they will say, we go where talent lies. Microsoft, Boston Scientific, mm -hmm. uh, they want quality, reliability, but they want talent. Ireland being a member of the European Union, where we have access to the European labor force, as well as growing our own um, skills, as we've just discussed earlier. Um, and I don't think we can lose sight of that, that the inward uh, migration of people into Ireland is an important factor in, an, or in our economic growth. And we need to state that uh, boldly, yeah. really, no, because there are forces gathering, in my view, uh, that could undermine um, that. 100%. No, 100%. You know, we are actually one of the more multicultural countries in Europe these days. So the census came out there uh, yep. with the figures for last year. So one in five residents of Ireland today were born elsewhere. Now that figure is actually right up there. Uh, it's not as high as Luxembourg, which is a tiny state, right? But it's right up there uh, with Sweden. I think now we're third in terms of the percentage uh, of people who were born elsewhere, higher than the UK, higher than the US even today. Uh, you know, and, and again, think about in our lifetimes, right? So, I mean, go back to the the, the, even the 1990s, before we had that boom, the, the equivalent figure was was only 7%. A lot of those were, were let's say, sons and daughters of returning immigrants from yes. Britain or, or, or the States. So we, we have radically uh, uh, transformed now. In fact, uh, obviously, 
this means that in macro terms, we've turned, of course, from being a, a, a country of emigration to a country of immigration. And I mean, hell, that's a hell of a lot better place to be. Uh, but also, interestingly, I talk about it in the book how we're now, instead of relying on, on emigrants' remittances into Ireland, which we did, of course, in the 40s Absolutely, and 50s, yeah, yeah. now we're the other way around. Ireland is a net source of about one point one and a half two billion dollars come out of Ireland every year to help people uh, in countries like Nigeria and Poland and India. That's a great thing. That's yeah. a good thing. We're helping those yeah. countries. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it, and in many ways, to me, nothing illustrates and by the way, it causes pressure. I, I acknowledge that, but nothing illustrates the progress Ireland has made than that population growth. Sometimes I, I think we underestimate it in public policy as well. And I make this point at government all of the time that the big change has been population growth. Sometimes I think public expenditure and others don't realize the impact on services, the need it creates for additional services. But we've turned around the famine in some respects. Mm. The famine was a, a most almost fatalistic, you know, it was an incredible impact on our population. And you, as you have said, we no growth in employment for maybe the first up to the 19. Uh, yeah. 60s, 70s, up to the 90s, really, yeah. uh, in real terms. Population is stagnant up until, I think, uh, the early 90s, uh, in around three, 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 three odd million. Yes. Um, and suddenly we're 5.1 million yes. uh, in the space of 25, 30, 30 years. Um, and it's been declined from 1845. That's turned around. Uh, and, uh, and this is very challenging for us as a society and as a country. Uh, we're now an attractive place for people to come to live and work in. It creates accommodation, housing pressures and all of that. But it also creates a vitality and a talent base, which means more ingenuity, uh, more value added, you know. Yes. Uh, in exactly. our history books, we learned that the Vikings and the Normans became more Irish than the Irish themselves. I don't know. Yes. Do you remember that? Phrase? Yes. Yes. And in many ways, historically, going back over the centuries, people come and go. And, and the challenge now is to make sure that we understand the value from that as opposed to always focusing in on the negatives. Yeah, I think we're already seeing, you know, the cultural benefits and the sporting benefits of some of these uh, new Irish or first generation Irish, if you like, uh, uh, which we, and more to come with that, hopefully. I mean, as you say, we're actually unusual as a country in our rate of population growth. Uh, Europe as a whole, right, the continent of, of Europe, uh, EU, decreased in population the last couple of years. Italy, for example, lost a million people over the last five or six yeah. years. A lot of countries are, are, are already beginning to decline. Ireland isn't. We're seeing immigration, which is be positive. Of course, as you say, that's putting challenges in particular on accommodation. Obviously, we all know the, the challenges uh, around there not being uh, enough new homes. I mean, you know, back in the Celtic Tiger days, we were, you know, delivering yep. 90,000 a year. Obviously, we're touching back now on, on, on 30,000. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, we're suffering from, you know. We have to do more and we have to d d do more faster um, yeah. to, to deal with the housing issue, particularly for younger people. Uh, because, you see, amidst all of this optimism and sort of positivity, there is stories under, uh, underneath this in terms of you know, notwithstanding wage growth and employment growth for young people today to buy a house is still very difficult and that's why a whole range of schemes have been uh, made available now to try and enable people to afford to buy um, and, and to give the option of, of, of home ownership which I think is an important anchor in society as well as social housing for those that, that are not in a position uh, to purchase homes. But we do need to get above 30,000. Uh, we need to be getting to uh, certainly, uh, I think, an average of 40,000 per annum. We're getting there, I think, and more and more young people now are drawing down mortgages and uh, but we need uh, you know we need to move faster because of that population pressure exactly that has come, exactly know. no I, I mean I call it out I in the book as one of our challenges obviously uh, you know for this decade it, it, because to me if we don't fix it soon enough it begins to undermine one of uh, Ireland's other success factors which for me is our sense of community yes. we have a yeah. strong sense of togetherness right we don't have the polarization as much as other countries do you know we don't have the a, a them and us no matter how people try to create that sense you know in discourse there isn't a real them and us you know anyone you point to in a position of leadership probably came from a state school you know pro you know yes, their, their yeah, brothers yeah, yeah. and sisters are still maybe living on the you know on the farm or where you know so I mean the point is we we don't have a hugely divisive uh, uh, country uh, in terms of our our, our social uh, capital if you like 
But this is, however, not solving the housing crisis. That's where you introduce a potential fracture point where you know, it's fine yeah, for me yeah. in my 50s to be sitting here and saying that, yep. uh, how great everything is with my mortgage. Uh, but, you know, for those who can't get on the ladder, who, you know, maybe even postponing starting a family. because There, there is a generational you know, issue there uh, of that. There is no doubt. And, and I think the focus has to be on, on, on helping younger people, I think, uh, and single people to, to get access to housing uh, mm. in different forms. And I think cost rental is coming in as a new model will gain critical mass. Uh, and, and the help to buy scheme and, and, and the um, first home scheme are beginning to give opportunities to people to buy but it's the scale of it and maybe modern methods of construction more rapid build uh, is, I think our industry has been slow uh, we're very innovative in some forms of industry I often think in construction we could move faster and there's evidence of that beginning to happen uh, in terms of more rapid builds uh, and high quality rapid r- rapid build housing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the jargon is modern methods of uh, uh, construction. Okay. But I think it, it's happening in in other jurisdictions, UK and elsewhere, and it could happen here and should happen here, maybe with greater rapidity and also more timber frame housing, yes. uh, which probably brings us to, I mean, all of that economic development, I think we it's fair to say it's been dramatic, it's been transformative, and the population growth that has come with it <clears throat> also brings challenges and uh, as someone committed to climate change and biodiversity restoration we have a, r- a reconcilable here t- to some degree or we, we, we have to try and factor it in with those sort of record levels of economic growth over three or four decades puts enormous challenges on environment and in basically and you bring this out in the book we're one of the worst per capita uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions uh, and that is a real, <coughs> mm. if you like, black spot in terms of the, the more broadly optimistic nature of, 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 of the book uh, and Optimist Guides to Ireland at, at 100. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, we're giving out about 13 tons of CO2 uh, type gases per, per person, which yeah, is, is one of the highest in, in Europe, well above the average. Uh, you know, and look, part of our challenge is that, uh, and I, I talked to the, uh, the Director General of the, of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, you know, I- the book, and she was saying, look, when you look at other European countries, they, their major gases are coming from industrial sector. So new technologies can address that. There are ways of, of stopping yes. those emissions. You know, our biggest one is agriculture, agriculture which yeah. is a lot. You know, not, not so many new technologies <laughs> that have been discovered to address that there at this point. So, so. I mean, a, well, they're the, emerging and um, they're they're emerging. I mean, we we have made we well, we should note the success, you know, in, in deciding what to write about the environment for the book. I, I thought really it's one where you could take a glass half empty or a glass half full approach. But you mentioned forestry. I decided to put it in as a positive because let's acknowledge the achievements. Sure. We have challenges. Right. Uh, but a fire station you mentioned. Right. So who knew? Right. That in 1922. One percent of the landmass yeah, of Ireland was true. forested. Now it's eleven percent. So yeah, we had this huge improvement. Now, okay, some people might say it's not the right trees. Yeah, we're learning. We're learning. But actually, we have made improvements in that and so many other areas. Wastewater treatment, for example. You know, we're not dumping so much out there. Our our, our transition to renewable electricity generation. I mean, twenty years ago it was five percent. Now it's forty yeah. percent. I mean, so you know, we are making huge strides with accepting. Of course, there's a lot more to go. Yeah, I think that that's that, that's fair, and I think in, in in many respects, I was talking to a botanist yesterday. Um, the real damage to our biodiversity was in centuries before the twentieth century, particularly in trees. Um, you can go back two or three centuries when we just deforested, um, and uh, in terms of the potato crop leading into the famine, you know, that that monoculture thing. And so a lot of biodiversity was destroyed, but a lot more still. So we have to really work fast to restore biodiversity. Um, And um, that's why I favor the Nature Restoration Directive that the Swedish presidency compromised on. There's all sorts of debates going on in the EU Parliament as to what eventual proposal will emerge, but a proposal um, should emerge. What worries me, though, is the water quality reports from the EPA. That can't go on, uh, and um, I, I, I would be very clear about that. I think we have a real issue in terms of water, river water quality and all our lakes and so on across mm. the country. That That is not a good story, um, as yeah. revealed by the EPA, and um, that's something we definitely have to work on. You know, and, and look, it is a real challenge here because, you know, it's not easy. Where we have managed 
as an economy over the last 10 years to decouple economic growth from our CO2 emissions. So we're holding level, essentially, our CO2 emissions while the economy is storming forward. So that's a success. Yeah, yeah. But of course, we need to reduce, right? The, the, the challenge is, of course, what is our most successful indigenous uh, sector is, of course, food and drink yeah. production alongside tourism, perhaps. But, you know, we are the largest exporter of beef in the Northern Hemisphere. In absolute terms, not per capita, in absolute terms, the Northern Hemisphere, you know, but of course, those are the cows. And at the same time, uh, we provide 10% of the world's um, uh, global infant formula, 10% produced here. But again, that's coming from the dairy sector. Yes, yep, yep, so yep. so there are great successful export industries uh, for Ireland here, of course. Uh, and a- again, if we look back over the 100 years, part of our success has been the diversification of those markets. You know, we were so reliant on Britain for so long after the 1920s. I mean, you know, we we're still sending 96% of our exports to Britain in the 40s. By the 60s, it was still more than three quarters. You know, it, it really took a while for us Which to Which I think to speaks to the importance of a adaptability and flexibility and the capacity to respond to crisis. And I think we've done that well in the last number of years, if I say so myself, I think particularly on Brexit. I think that was managed and navigated. But mm. I think at the heart of it, though, is the membership of the European Union. And I, I think we have to keep saying to people, it matters. Uh, and um, that diversification, there's no question that happened because of membership of the European Union. We started looking I- in a more focused way mm beyond just the bilateral relationship with the UK, which is still very, very important, very important for on a whole range of levels, the trade economy, people to people and so on. But the European one, I think, has been so invigorating um, for Ireland. I, I, I yeah. genuinely believe that. Well, you know, you say you're a supporter of the EU. So are the Irish, actually. Uh, yes. uh, you know, I was only looking at, at recent Eurobarometer uh, polls. It's, it's regularly tracked at European surveys. The Irish are the number one supporters uh, of e- the EU from within the EU country set. So we are number one, more than eight in 10 of us uh, are believe that joining the EU was good for our, our country, uh, high, right up there at the very top of the table. And uh, more than 80% of Irish people are optimistic about the future of the EU, again, way higher uh, than yeah, most other countries. We're, we're up there with the, the Nordic set. And I think you know, for me, I do say in the book, look, you know, our hundred year history was probably a, a, about our disconnection from Britain, our opening up to the rest of the world, our, our, our looking outwards. But we probably still haven't completely got off our obsession with the UK and, and perhaps also with the US. But on most of these tables, we're now ahead of them, really, in, in income and in income equality and in standard of living. You know, of course, we should learn the <laughs> best from them, but it's time to look to the Nordic countries. It's These are the ones that are at the very, very I, top of I the agree. table. I agree. It's very interesting that almost sense of an inferiority complex with the British to a certain extent because yes. I was watching this week the John F. Kennedy um, 50 year, and there's a wonderful um, exhibition in the in the um, in the epic in the epic center, and I, the Garda Commissioner says uh, this is the biggest event in Ireland. This is the visit of John F. Kennedy. And no doubt he says there will be British journalists who will try to pick faults and criticise us. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it was very interesting that his benchmark was yes. British journalists who are going to find fault with our performance. Well. I suppose there's something in the psyche there, isn't there? Um, but, yes. but, 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 but we just look, look, get over it. And yes. <laughs> we are now out there. Yes. And it's interesting, both Ireland and Europe are not good at identifying the positives. And um, so during COVID, for example, Europe was the key uh, don- donor globally of vaccines, the key manufacturer of, of vaccines and, and both don- donations and export. The only block really in the world uh, or entity that did it so comprehensively yet got tons mm-hmm. of criticism f- from everybody. And I, it's a real bugbear of mine to, to, to see this because every day I see Europe trying to uh, give to try and resolve conflict all over the world. And sometimes it gets portrayed here in some quarters as a sort of militaristic enterprise when actually, in reality, it is anything of, of, of the yeah. sort. Where I'm coming to really is, and, and uh, towards the, the, the end of the book, you kind of asked the question, well, why don't we believe this? <laughs> or yes. what is it that yes. in our psyche that sort of doesn't really want to acknowledge that actually progress has been made? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, uh, and before we lose the point, you know, we were recently judged. The World Press Freedom Index said we have the second yeah. freest media in the world. The Economist Intelligence Unit said we are the eighth most democratic country in the world, right? You know, the uh, Transparency International says we are the 10th least corrupt country in the world. I mean, these are 
astonishing things. You know, second, fifth, tenth, we could argue over the position. It doesn't matter. This country works. This country, democracy works. Yes. In fact, eight in ten, eight in ten Irish people are satisfied with democracy. It puts us fifth highest. Right now, of course, that doesn't mean that they're happy necessarily with your performance or your decision yep. today or the government on this, that or the other. But we recognize we have a system that is responsive to the people, actually. So actually, this is a very good place to live and has an economic, uh, sorry, a, a, a democratic system that others are looking to in terms of our participative democracy, the way we're bringing people in through constitutional conventions. I mean, these are models other countries are looking Absolutely. at. You know. yeah. But as you say, sometimes we don't give ourselves that credit. And, you know, the news cycle, you might say, Mark, doesn't represent any of that. What's going wrong? I, you know, and I, I talk in the book about the five psychological biases that blind us to positive progress. You know, and, and look, human beings are built for the negative. You know, our ancestors were, were, were tuned to, to manage risk. I mean, the average lifespan, you know, you go back 10,000 years. It wasn't beyond 30, 35 years. It was, it was the average of people lived. They did, you know, they just needed to survive. And in that context, we built in our brains a, a negativity bias. So all the evidence is there through psychology that, you know, if there's an, an equally positive or negative thing, we all pay attention to the negative. That's what we give our eyeballs, our attention to, because that's what helped the ancestors survive, you know, yep, manage yep. the risk, avoid the avoid the line, run faster, you know. So so we do have that tendency. So, I, you know, I, I don't blame media outlets for serving us with negative news. That is what we're paying attention to. Yeah, and there's we, probably a value in it somewhere. Uh, somewhere, but we do need to be reminded, step back, see the bigger context. And when we talk about it, people go, oh, yeah, well, no, actually, within my lifetime, my life compared to those of my kids, I can see a difference, you know. So so, so we do need to be reminded of the positive, hence the writing of the book, in fact. Yeah. But, but you know, also our attention spans are pretty short, actually. Yeah. So I, I talk about a study that was done uh, uh, in the States, uh, University of California and, uh, and Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where they looked at people's uh, uh, tweets about the weather. People go, oh, it's really cold today. It's really warm in the States. And they used uh, weather maps to see where people were tweeting from and what the actual weather was. And they mapped it back. And the point is, the point is that if there was a dramatic change in weather within something that, that over the last five years, they'd say, oh, yeah, compared to long, you know, five years ago or three years ago or last year, it's really warm today. And people could, could and would comment on that. But the weather compared to 10 years ago or 20 years ago, people were weren't commenting on it. In other words, those long, slow moving changes, we as human beings That's find true. it very difficult to conceptualize. We're able to think the last couple of years, yeah, things are better or they're worse or they're not or whatever. But we find it very difficult to think about this progress. It's a, I call it progress attention deficit. We're actually slow at paying attention to those long moving, the slow moving yep, changes yep, and improvements, which is so much of the progress we've made over the last hundred years. We don't make it in five years. It takes 10 or 20 or and 50. The dan- yeah, that sense of immediacy that people want. Uh, and the danger from a policy formulation point of view is that we tend to go too short term at times. And that's why I think that's the value of the book in many respects. You stand back and say, this worked. Yes. And, you know, we, we talk about democracy there. It's important that people participate too. You know, the, the last general election yes. uh, matched the one from 2002 when only uh, six in 10 of us turned out to vote in the general election. You know, and that, that was the lowest figure really since the foundation yes. of, of the state. You know, that that's not good. No, I, I mean, it I speaks agree. a little bit to complacency, dare I say it, that we're thinking, you know, things are going fine. You know, maybe I don't need to vote. But if, if, if the center doesn't come out and represent its perspective, then those very factors that have contributed to our success will be undermined. You know, the, the, the policies, the investment in education, the openness as a nation, our, our stability, uh, you know, our, 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 our avoidance of swings to the left, uh, extreme left and the extreme right yes, that have served is. Ireland in good yeah. stead. Uh, and overall, uh, that, that uh, social cohesiveness, that sense of community will be fractured if we're not all expressing our voices because we have uh, a proportional representation system that has worked really well in building a, a coalition governments that have been propose. representative yeah. of, of the will of the people, in fact. I think that's a very fair point. It worries me. I watch across Europe as I go to f- Foreign Affairs Council meetings and as, as Taoiseach, um, the challenges that countries are facing now from the emergence of far right uh, um, and, and sort of short termism uh, in, in policy, uh, which can be very, very damaging. And it's a concern I have as, as we're now moving. I, I think we were behind many other countries, but we've now become very multicultural and we could lose the key ingredients that has enabled our success and progress, notwithstanding all of the challenges we still have. 
uh, it's very easy to lose that. Uh, and I think that's why it is important that, that um, you know, as you said, people believe in the fundamentals of our structures uh, and, you know, the recent rows around broadcasting and so on like that. We, sha we, we should not lose the big picture there uh, and the importance of media. I often say, you know, when I go out and meet people at a market in, in, in Cork or go into the English market or uh, in Douglas Market and so on, people are there's great chat and that sense of community and, and so on. Yet if you go online, uh, there's so much hostility and toxicity, which actually doesn't reflect the, where people yeah. are out Agreed. there. On this. That's my sense of it. Yeah. Uh, people don't want that hostility. They want issues sorted. They want fairness. They want um, uh, no eagles. I, I mean, if you're reared in Cork, uh, I can tell you they don't tolerate eagles <laughs> and you're cut down to size very quickly. And that's the way it should be. Um, I so th yeah, I think, I think we need to yeah. uh, continue to affirm uh, that centre and affirm yes. participation in life. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a strength of the Irish electoral system, the multi-seat constituency. Some people say, oh, you know, it means that, you know, pump, exactly, and, and parish pump, pump politics yeah. rules and people can't see the bigger picture because they're drawn down to constituency issues. But actually, that has made our politicians close to the people. Yes. You know, and that is Absolutely. not a bad thing. That has been a good thing. I, I mean, the evidence is before us and our success as a nation and what we've achieved, that our political system has not a them and us. Our politicians are not up there ahead of the people. It's not hard to meet I me, Hall Martin, if you need to make a point to him. It's a very fair point because I remember I, I did political science and master's in political history and I had to study all that area once time and you know, they are, we should be more sophisticated like the Europeans and have list systems and so on like that. And there are times I gravitated to that, but then when I sat in clinics uh, in Ballyfehan or Mahan or parts of my constituency, a person would come in. They were, an, they were, they were the canary in the mine t t telling you something's wrong with the system, something isn't working here and you need to change it. Um, or other times you'd, someone would come with a very good idea mm. that the system didn't uh, turn up. Um, and so that connectivity, whereas it is, it can be owners to us, a lot of man, uh, hours and so on go into it, but... Um, it, it, it does have that connectivity, but also that sense of we're not totally removed from the realities on the ground. Yeah. That you have a, more, a, a quicker uh, sort of alarm system to say uh, you need to start changing this because this isn't working for, for, yeah. for people on the ground. And uh, it's a very, I think, actually, I've come, f you know, my view is full circle. And we need to keep that connectivity and, and, and multi-seat uh, proportion representation gives us that. Now it gives us fragmentation as well, but that means we have to work in coalition governments and form with other parties and compromise and, 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 and so on like that. But, you know, that's no bad thing either. Uh, no, I, 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 I think not. Uh, I think the know. evidence is there that it has worked for Ireland. Ireland has had a fabulous, uh, when, what do you say, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? Of course there's problems. Of course in that time there we had a significant downturn. Of course, the, you know, we made wrong decisions at wrong times. No country is perfect. But objectively, Ireland is now one of the best places to live on the planet, of course, that's not the case for everybody. But Ireland, the, our formula has worked well. We need to double down on some of the things that have been our success factors heading into the second century. But step back, in fact, look at how Ireland has done and you have to be optimistic about what we've achieved. Mark, I, I, I thank you very much indeed. And I, could I say to you, I mean, there's much more in this book. There's a very good chapter on women uh, and the advancement of progress in terms of the lives of women in Ireland yes. and children you yes. know, around uh, infant mortality and so on, dramatic progress. Uh, but we can talk about those perhaps uh, in, 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 in further uh, podcasts maybe. Uh, I mean, thank you very much indeed. I would just recommend to people, uh, in fact, An Optimist Guide to Ireland at 100 by Mark Henry uh, is a great book to read uh, and will give you a sense of perspective uh, on how Ireland has performed in its first 100 years since independence and then lays out the challenges uh, for the next 50. Thanks for the time and thanks for the chance to talk about Ireland's success. We need more of that. Absolutely. Take care.